Smith from uh, Missouri State University. I'm in the Department of Computer Science there. Uh, I realized on Saturday that I was giving a sports-related talk on the night of the NCAA basketball championship game. So I wasn't sure if anybody would, uh, would come out tonight, but uh, so thanks for, for being here. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is uh, some of the uh, things that uh, were shown in the movie, and then also I'd like to talk a little bit about how the Royals applied some of these principles to win the pennant last year. Uh, so if some of you may not be baseball fans, so uh, we'll start with a few definitions here. Batting average is the number of base hits divided by the number of times a player is at bat. And the batting average uh, doesn't take into account walks. And so we heard Billy Bean talking about uh, does he care whether somebody gets on base with a walk or a hit, and, and no, he doesn't. And so on base percentage uh, takes into account the number of times a player walks as well as gets base hits. Uh, slugging percentage takes into account the power of a hitter, the home runs and extra base hits that a, that a player uh, hits. And then OPS is uh, one of the best uh, uh, correlates uh, to run production, and that's uh, on base percentage plus slugging percentage. And so a lot of times you'll hear uh, uh, people judge hitters based on their OPS. So the uh, Oakland A's were and, and are a small market team. Uh, in 2002, the year of the, uh, the Moneyball year, the year of the movie, uh, they were, uh, well, here was their payroll compared to all the rest of baseball. So they weren't quite last, but they were pretty close. And uh, so they were competing with teams such as the Yankees, uh, who they played in the uh, uh, 2001 uh, division series. Um, and uh, so they were having to compete with a small payroll, as, and, as we saw in the movie. Uh, Billy Bean would be the first to say that he actually didn't come up with the idea that walks are important. Uh, as early as 1917, a guy named F.C. Lane argued that on-base percentage is important and that walks are important. And then uh, in the 1950s, Branch Rickey, the legendary general manager of the Dodgers and some other teams, uh, also argued for taking the walk into account. Uh, Bill James, uh, this actually is a, a scene from the movie or was shown in the movie. Uh, Bill James started publishing uh, a series of annual baseball abstracts in the 1970s. 1977 was the first one. And a lot of what he argued were these things that, uh, that Players were not evaluated correctly. Teams did not build their, their teams correctly because they were ignoring a lot of these kinds of things. Uh, in 1983, Sandy Alderson, Alderson became the general manager of the athletics, and he was actually the one who started uh, emphasizing uh, power and on-base percentage with the Oakland athletics. Uh, he was influenced by Bill James. Uh, he hired Billy Bean as an advanced scout in 1990. In 1993, he promoted uh, Billy Bean to assistant general manager of the athletics. And then in uh, 1998, uh, Alderson left to work for the league, and uh, Billy Bean became the general manager of the athletics. They actually had a small payroll uh, starting in about 1995, I believe, is when the team was bought by Steve Schott, and he put them on a pretty strict budget uh, even as early as 1995. So in 2000 new, it actually wasn't really a new thing that they had to uh, compete with a low, low payroll. Uh, but then uh, in 2002 was the year that, uh, that was covered in the movie. In 2003, the book came out by uh, Michael Lewis, uh, Moneyball, and then the movie uh, was made in 2011. So there were two major uh, issues that we saw in the movie, uh, two major uses of data analysis. And the first was building a team. So how do you build a team to win? And then the other was baseball strategy. And specifically, Billy Bean told the players he didn't want them to steal and he didn't want any bunts. And specifically, he was talking about sacrifice bunts, really. When the other team bunts, they're giving you an out. And he didn't want to give the other team outs. Um, so we'll first talk about team building. So Peter Brand said, uh, we need to win 99 games to make the playoffs. And so, of course, you can look at the average of 
uh, number of games that it needs year, year after year to make the playoffs, and that's what he decided was they needed to win 99 games. So how do you win 99 games? Well, this is uh, a formula developed by Bill James. Called, he calls it the Pythagorean Theorem. And, of course, the Pythagorean Theorem is just because it looks kind of like the Pythagorean Theorem that we all learned in school. So the idea is that if you square the number of runs you score and then divide that by the number of runs scored squared plus the number of runs allowed squared, you can predict your winning percentage. And that's really a remarkable result when you consider that sometimes you win a game by 10 runs and sometimes you lose by one run and so forth. But it's actually very accurate and uh, predicts the number of wins a team uh, makes uh, within just a couple of percent. So uh, that was the, uh, the thing that he was talking about. And then uh, Peter Brand decided they needed to score 114 runs and give up 645 runs. And that way they would win 99 games. In fact, they scored 800 runs and they gave up uh, 654 runs that year. And they won 103 games. So they actually uh, exceeded the projection by, uh, by several games. Uh, but the idea then is we look at that as a team level, but then if we can predict how many runs a player will create for the team and how many runs a player will keep from scoring against the team, then we can decide which players we want to sign, which free agents do we want to sign, which trades do we want to make and, uh, in order to win a certain number of games. Uh, so here is the runs created formula taken out of a baseball abstract, and again, this, we saw this in the movie. Uh, so if we take the number of hits plus the number of walks minus the number of times caught stealing, multiply that times the total bases, so uh, doubles and triples and home runs are taken into account there, and uh, add .7 times the number of stolen bases, and then divide that by the number of at-bats plus walks plus number of times caught stealing, then we can determine how many runs a player created for his team. And if you do this player by player, it actually does come out to be very close to the number of runs that the team scored. For example, Scott Hatterberg, if you run this formula, uh, Scott Hatterberg created 78.4 runs in 2002. So how many runs does a player keep from scoring? Well, that's not so hard to figure out for pitchers because we can look at the number of runs that other teams score against pitchers and so forth. But it's very hard for fielding because fielding is hard to measure. And for that reason, it's been largely ignored. Uh, we heard Billy Bean say when he was talking about Scott Hatterberg, he can't throw and he can't field, but he gets on base. So he was uh, ignoring the defensive aspect. And in fact, we heard that several times throughout the movie. And I heard this morning as I was driving into work, uh, there was a, uh, an interview on uh, the sports reporters with Ned Reynolds. It was uh, Bob Nightingale, who's a sports writer for USA Today, and he said, you don't pay for uh, defense. So even now, defense isn't uh, as highly regarded just because it is hard to determine uh, how effective players are in defense. Uh, we do have some recent methods. Uh, and so uh, nowadays we're tracking the players on each play, uh, where they start out on the field, where they wind up. And some of this is now being done by video analysis so that we can measure how uh, good a player's range is related to other players in the same position and so forth. And then the goal is that we can determine how many runs a player saves compared to an average player at that position. Um, Okay, so then let's move on to baseball strategy. So Billy Bean said, no more stealing. I pay you to get on first, he said, not to get thrown out at second. Uh, so this all revolves around the expected run matrix. And so, in fact, a lot of baseball strategy revolves around this matrix. So the idea is that by crunching many thousands of games of baseball, we can figure out how many runs we expect to score in any given situation. The matrix can change over time depending on how much power uh, is, uh, players are hitting, how many home runs are being hit, and so forth. And, uh, and that's been affected, of course, by the uh, performance-enhancing drugs and so forth. This matrix here was calculated, I believe, between the years 1993 and 2010. So this would have been the matrix during the time of Moneyball. 
Um, so the idea is if we don't have any runners on base, so at the beginning of the inning, no runners on base, no outs, we expect on average to score about half a run. Uh, if the first batter makes an out, we now expect to score about three-tenths of a run on average. And if the first two batters are out, we expect to score a little over a tenth of a run from that situation. Where it gets really interesting is when you start having runners on base. So with a runner on first base, we expect on average to score about nine-tenths of a run. Well, so if you steal, if you try to steal second base, you're trying to move from this position in the matrix to this position in the matrix where you have a runner on second with nobody out. And you can see that on average that will gain you roughly two tenths of a run. On the other hand, if you get thrown out at second, you're now in this position where you've got one out and nobody on base, so now you're down to expecting to score three tenths of a run on average. So getting thrown out at second base has cost you almost seven tenths of a run if you are successful, it gains you about two-tenths of a run. And so that's why Billy Bean is reluctant to see his runners try to steal, because the payoff isn't as great as the loss if you get thrown out. It turns out that, in fact, you have to be successful about 65% of the time in order for, for runs to pay off. Here, in fact, is the number of steals that the uh, Oakland Athletics attempted uh, and against the major league average. So the, the red line is the major league average from the year 2000 to 2014 to, to last year. And you can see that the athletics didn't try to steal very much. Up until about 2008, the number of steals jumped dramatically. And in fact, I don't think Billy Bean or any other general manager would just say, don't steal. It depends on your personnel. So with the personnel they had in 2002 and 2004 and so forth, they didn't have base stealers. But around 2008, they got some players who were better at stealing bases, and so they did start stealing a lot more bases. And down here you can see their success rate. And for the most part, except for this bad year in 2005 and a little bit in 2007, for the most part they've been above the major league average in success rate. Uh, in 2002, they attempted uh, roughly 70 steals, and they were successful 70, about 70% 70 of the time. Uh, in some of these other years, 2008, when they started stealing more, well, they were successful about 80% of the time. And, and so when you're successful that much, then it does pay to steal more bases. Uh, now, he also said no bunts. <clears throat> so... With a bunt, typically you're in this situation here. You might have a runner on first base, and you're trying to move from this position in the matrix to this position in the matrix. So you're starting trying to go from runner on first base with nobody out to a runner on second base with one out. And you can see that on average that doesn't pay off. On average you actually lose by bunting that player to second. But on the other hand, there are times, uh, for example, if it's the bottom of the ninth inning, you don't care about scoring a number of runs. You want to score one run. So this matrix here shows the odds of scoring at least one run. So if you have a runner on first base, nobody out, you have a 44.1% chance, historically, of scoring at least one run. So if it's the bottom of the ninth, that's what you're looking at. Uh, if you bunt that player over, now you're moving to this position in the matrix. So again, you've actually lost some of your chance of scoring a run here. So in general, it doesn't pay off. However, if your pitcher is batting, it all depends on how, how confident you are in the batter at the plate. So if your pitcher is batting, then you're probably going to go from this position to this position if you don't bunt. And that's why position, uh, pitchers often bunt. But of course, in the American League, uh, the pitchers don't bat unless you're playing uh, interleague games. So for the most part, uh, an American League team is going to be in this position where you're looking at, at these two things and you've got a, a probably a, at least a decent hitter at bat and so you don't want to bunt very much. Uh, in fact, uh, the A's from 2002 to 2007, they averaged 21 and a half sacrifice bunts over those years. 
the American League average, and I just uh, uh, just use the American League average there because the National League average would be quite a bit higher because their pitchers are batting. So on average, the uh, uh, American League teams were batting uh, almost 36 times per game or per, per season, uh, whereas the A's were only uh, batting 21 times, 21 and a half times. Uh, in 2008, though, the A's started bunting more. And again, I guess they had faster players, and so they, uh, uh, for whatever reason, they started uh, uh, using more bunts. And in the last couple of years, I didn't put that here, but in the last couple of years, they've dropped back down. Uh, in 2013 and 2014, they're getting closer to the 21.5 again. Um, here is a scene where Peter Brand is uh, telling, I guess that's Hatterberg, he's telling him uh, these are the pitches you should be hitting. So uh, in fact, here is a, uh, a graph that shows Colton Wong's hitting. And so Peter Brand would say to Colton Wong, these are your pitches. So this, this shows the slugging percentage at different positions in the strike zone and out of the strike zone. So on pitches that are on the outside edge of the strike zone, and Colton Wong's a left-handed batter, so he's batting, uh, he has a slugging percentage of 854 on those pitches. Uh, and the pitch that's right down the middle of the plate, uh, he's batting, uh, or he has a slugging percentage of 667. On most of these other places in the zone, he's uh, slugging less than 400. And so, again, Peter Brand would tell him, these are the pitches you want to jump on, and if, unless you have two strikes, you'd probably be better off taking these pitches. Um, and again, this is all done now with video analysis. Uh, every major league ballpark has a camera in it that uh, tracks the location of every pitch. So we get this data uh, for every, every pitch of every game. Uh, okay, so I'd like to now talk a little bit about the Royals. So a lot of times you'll hear people say, the lesson of Moneyball is that walks are important and that on-base percentage is important. Well, the really fundamental lesson of Moneyball is buy undervalued assets. And uh, so in 2002, on-base percentage was undervalued. In 2014, speed and defense are the things that are undervalued. And so the Royals stocked up on speed and defense. Uh, speed is undervalued because stealing bases is somewhat out of fashion. When I was growing up in the 60s and 70s, we had Mari Wills and Lou Brock and players like that stealing more bases than teams, entire teams, steal nowadays. Uh, so uh, speed is a little bit out of favor. And defense, again, because it's hard to measure, is uh, undervalued. And so the Royals uh, stocked up on speed and defense. They uh, led the major league in steals this year. They had 153, and the next closest uh, was, well, it wasn't close. The, that was by far and away the most steals of any team. Uh, and they had an 81% success rate. So they were very successful, and so that uh, helped their run production. They were actually last in home runs. Power costs money. Uh, historically, uh, teams, uh, the home run hitters are the ones that, that make lots of money, and so uh, uh, the Royals don't have a lot of power hitters. Uh, it was kind of interesting that I noticed that St. Louis was next to last, so these both teams made the playoffs in spite of uh, not having a lot of power. Now, the Royals are last in walks, so I don't think Billy Bean would be too impressed with that. But they're also last in strikeouts. And so uh, when you have fast players putting the ball in play, it puts a lot of uh, stress on the defense. And in fact, teams made a lot of errors against the Royals uh, because there was so much pressure in, on the, uh, uh, with those fast players and, and putting the ball in play. Uh, they also had the best fielding defense in Major League Baseball. <clears throat> and uh, some sports writers uh, claim that when uh, uh, Jared Dyson goes into the game, and he he's usually goes in as a defensive replacement, uh, that they have uh, the best defensive outfield in baseball history. Uh, the infield was, was above average, but it was really the outfield that, uh, that really shined for the, uh, for the Royals. Uh, and uh, if we uh, could play this uh, video here... And,
So this is from the Kansas City Royals website. And this is how the Royals uh, won the pennant. So the Royals uh, are another small market team, and they have to uh, have to deal with a low payroll. I think they were 25th or 27th in the league in payroll last year. So uh, they've had to be smart, and and they've applied the lessons, uh, even though they do it in a different way. Um, I'll be glad to take any questions if if anybody has any. Yeah. Uh, in soccer, they have, uh, with football, they have GPS chips that they put in the shoes now of players, and it tracks the players all over <laughs> the field. And I've often thought that that'd be a great thing for baseball. Where you could I hadn't heard that. That's, uh, that's pretty amazing. Well, in fact, video can track the players. Um, the video uh, is that good these days. Uh, but that's another level that they could maybe look at. Okay, anything else? Yes? What inspired you, statistically? I mean... <laughs> 
Well, uh, I, uh, I like sports, and uh, I, uh, I actually come from a pattern recognition background. I worked in speech recognition, and so there's a lot of data analysis there. And so uh, when you can apply data analysis to something as fun as sports, well, I think that's, uh, that's a bonus. Uh, yeah, it has. Uh, sure, yeah. How does, that, how does it change the value of the stars, the, the high paid stars then? Well, um, to a certain extent, players uh, get rewarded for some of the things they didn't used to be rewarded for. However, the big stars are still the home run hitters, and that's probably always going to be true. Um, chicks dig the long ball, right? That's, uh, that was another movie, Bull Durham. Uh, so uh, they are still getting paid, and uh, it's just, I guess, the players who were undervalued are now getting uh, more what their true value is. Okay, well, thanks again for coming out, and thank you, Mike, for having this series. Uh, and I look forward to seeing the imitation game next week. <laughs>